Right, so this is a mathematical representation of a practically any model. You could invent maybe perhaps other schemes, but this is uh, actually useful. So this model has inputs, states, and outputs. So inputs here are shown as a vector of i. Vector means often in civil engineering models, inputs are real valued, also outputs. Not in all, but in most. So uh, you would have then uh, transformation of inputs into some vector of state variables. For example, in hydrological model, what are the inputs in a hydrological model? Precipitation and perhaps temperature if we think of snow melt. Okay, solar radiation as well, perhaps. But in most rainfall runoff models, precipitation is the input. What are the uh, outputs of this model? Street Sorry, the street, f f street, you said? Street. street. Ah, stream flow. Sorry, sorry. I still have to uh, get used. My English is not good, so sorry. That's it. So, yes, stream flow, yes, indeed, so that's right. Or water level sometimes, uh, if, but uh, typically, since we talk about water, water flow, so uh, water comes in, water comes out, okay? And the amount of water coming in should be more or less the same as the amount of water coming out, unless you have some storages uh, here. So, and what is the state of the hydrological model, state? What is the internal state? Internal state? It's soil moisture, for example. Okay, so it's how much water stays in the catchment. If we talk about catchment model, soil moisture in the catchment is this uh, state. So first it's transformed into soil moisture. Perhaps some flows also in the model, depending on complexity of the model. Uh, if it's a distributed model, then there would be many values for each cell in this distributed model or semi-distributed model. If it's lumped model, then it's only one value or two values. And outputs are indeed uh, flows at one point at the outlet of the catchment, or maybe at different points, if it's a distributed model, then you have flows at uh, different uh, elements. But it's good to think of any model uh, like this. Now, what is this x0 and, and uh, theta? So x0 is initial state of the model. So it's the same as x, but at the moment zero. So when you run the model, you always have to give these values to initial states, which you don't know often. Often you don't know what's happening in the beginning of your study. You have to assume something. <clears throat> and theta are parameters of this model. So these parameters, you see, uh, they uh, often don't depend on time. So we assume they're the same. For example, it's a roughness of a cross-section in a river. Okay? It's the properties of conductivity in a soil, and so on and so on. So all these parameters you have to fix somehow. And we'll discuss it how to fix uh, these parameters. Now. Uh, white box model, when we know vector of states. Black box model, then we don't know x, we know only input, output. That's why it's called black box, because we don't know what's inside this box. And gray box, it's partial knowledge. So very often we have partial knowledge of x or no knowledge. We often don't know all the states in the model. For example, we don't know soil moisture at each point in the catchment. Physically, of course, you can send one million people to measure everything, but. Uh, in reality, this is uh, not happening. Examples of models. Linear regression model, data-driven model, we'll talk about it uh, uh, later. Digital elevation model, or DEM, or digital terrain model, DTM. This. So, rough, uh, so this shows the, the depth of every point in the landscape uh, according to, say, mean sea level or whatever you take as a, as a basic uh, line, and these models are built <coughs> either by measurements or by measuring distance from satellites or by aerial photography or radars, uh, lidars, and so on. So these models are important. Why? Because if water flows across this catchment, you have to know slopes. It's important parameter of a catchment to know how fast waters would move from top to bottom because water moves downhill, as you heard. So <clears throat> we uh, can use different types of data to create DEM uh, using uh, aerial imagery, as I said, uh, satellite, but also physical uh, measurements. 
Now, this is also a mathematical model, Shazi, formula that describes mean flow of a steady, turbulent, open channel flow. It's empirical formula, written down, I don't know, 200 years ago, 150 years ago, so a long time ago. So if you know some parameters of this flow, you can then uh, deduce what would be the mean velocity of the flow. It somehow reflects the physics, of course, but not that much, actually. You know. I would also, we may call it maybe even data-driven model because it's based on empirical evidence. Empiricism is looking at the nature and measuring something. It's experience, right? So it's in a way data-driven model. Of course, it, it has physics in it, but so it's somewhere in between. These simplified formulas are used very often because more or less they serve the purpose. They give you some evaluation of velocities or whatever you measure. But if you want to build more accurate models, you have to switch from this traditional empirical formulas into more physically based mo formulas based on accurate representation of water motion uh, uh, in using detailed equations and typically they uh, differential equations like this one. This would be a homework to solve this system of equations by tomorrow. Uh, this is uh, Navier-Stokes' full uh, uh, set of equations in 3D fl fluid flow. Uh, well, quite complex uh, things. They take into account many things. Problem is they're unsolvable, typically, okay? So you cannot solve them in analytical form. So you cannot write a formula for the solution. For every point, if you want to measure, if you want to calculate the, uh, the pressure, or flow, or water level, or whatever. Very often when you use differential equations, they take such a form which is not solvable analytically. That's a problem. Okay, let's move on. Yes, so for example, this is uh, 1D San Venan equations. You can formulate Navier-Stokes, you can reduce it to 2D, to 1D, and 1D formulation uh, by uh, uh, it, it is a particular case of Navier-Stokes equations. However, you can formulate them without using full, uh, uh, full equations. Problem is, they're unsolvable. So there's continuity equation, which looks after the fact that amount of water coming in is the same as come, uh, uh, coming out, and momentum equation. So it's based on first order principle of Newton physics, and uh, it's just straightforward implementation of these laws of physics into uh, the uh, water flow. So we use different numerical schemes to solve these equations, this ones or other more complex uh, forms. And uh, this could be finite differences, uh, different types of schemes, finite elements, and so on and so on. And this forms the whole uh, research area, which is called num uh, numerical mathematics or numerical methods. When we say numerical methods, what we mean is numerical methods to solve differential equations. That's the full name. And then such models are called numerical models. It's a very unfortunate name because numerical model is a shortening of, it's a model using differential equations which are solved numerical methods for solving differential equations. And it's all called numerical model. But it doesn't reflect what's inside this model. It should be called physically based model because it's based on physics or biology or chemistry, whatever. So it's a process model. It's a model that describes processes. So a numerical model simply states the fact that they are solvable numerically. It means not analytically. You don't have, to, you don't know the, is it, yes. So you don't know value of your variables at any point. No, you know it only at the grid time against space for every, every given uh, point in this uh, uh, mesh or grid, which would be uh, computable. So there is a distance here which is finite. That's why it's called finite difference scheme, so finite. But for practical purpose, it's enough. Of course, you, use, you need digital computers. That's why, actually, computational hydraulics came only after invent of digital computing in the 50s, 40s and 50s. Before that, these equations were not possible to solve because humans are not able correctly to solve more than two pages of equations. There were multiple experiments made. Humans always made a mistake on page three. So it's impossible. That's why space exploration also happened only after invent of digital computing. 
because you were able to calculate trajectory of spacecraft or of a missile uh, only using uh, numerical solutions, and this would be accurately solved only using digital computing. So technology was there, but calculation base was not there. So this is how information technology or computer science, computers help to solve so societal problems, actually. Well, what it helped, of course, to build huge missiles to deliver nuclear bombs. So it's not very good use of uh, science, but also, as you know, nuclear weapons save the world from world war. So that's also maybe interesting thing to discuss in another course of lectures. So I should, go, should not go into, uh, uh, what is it, sensitive areas, which I typically try to do. So please bring me back to the water world. When do we need 3D models? So often in the forevers, we, we need to solve uh, uh, Sun Venan equations, often in simplified uh, form, like uh, in kinematic form and so on. We make certain assumptions, and often it's enough. But if you want to increase complexity and accuracy of the model, you have to increase complexity of equations, and you may end up with the need to solve uh, uh, 3D equations. For example, if you want to look at development of flow at the bends in industrial hydraulics, that's important when you have a complex uh, system of pipes, then how the flow would move. You want to look at turbulences here because turbulence lead to destruction of pipes and so on, cavitation effects and so on. So you would have many more effects coming up when you write more complex equations. But often for rivers, for catchments, you don't need it. It's enough to have zero order, one first order equations. And for 2D equations, you would use for flood modeling. Why you need 2D equations for flood modeling? Because the uh, 1D modeling would show you only depth but wouldn't show you dynamics of the water on the floodplain. And if floodplain have uh, resistances like vegetation and so on, you need 2D models to calculate accurately what would be the velocities across floodplains. Uh, this is when you would move to 2D, uh, 2D. Okay, this example I showed, and uh, Brett Sanders built, you remember this thing, the model of 2D model, which is important because it's a, it's a floodplain. It's a huge area which is covered with water. And if it's a, only a river, then it's enough to have 1D model. Okay, but in this course, we don't discuss 1D, 2D modeling. We would move to other areas, because 1D, 2D modeling, you can, uh, you perhaps had these courses in your studies, so you are better expert than I am in this. Now, one of the trends nowadays, and maybe last 10, 15 years, is to link results of modeling to visualization tools. In this case, for example, Google Earth is used to visualize results of modeling. So it's, in a way, GIS, Geographical Information System, where you uh, 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 integrate different layers with a lot of different information, and then you can play with these layers, and you can see it all, even online. If you go to uh, Earth Engine, you know, Google developed also Google Earth Engine, where they collect a lot of data about the world, and if you log in, you can write your own codes to analyze this data, it's an amazing uh, tool. Uh, and Google Earth is software that runs uh, here on the uh, laptop, but Google Earth Engine runs on the Google servers, so you get access through the browser to the Google Earth Engine, and then you have a lot of uh, modeling tools uh, available uh, for you, spatial modeling. So that's useful again, uh, because you can show also inundation profiles over here, as you see, uh, using traditionally used maps, with the additional information being uh, displayed here. And you can have a timeline, so you can move this slider and show how much would be flooded in time. But of course, you need to run the models in advance. So you save all the data in a NetCDF file or any other format, and then you would simply display this file showing what will be happening and on what day you would have maximum inundation like here, for example. Okay, this we discussed. This is uh, the figure of Mike Shi, which is widely used across, uh, across uh, uh, literature. As you see, there is 1D model, and DHI uses Mike, uh, Mike 11 model, which is 1D model solving Sun Venan equations uh, using Abbott uh, uh, scheme, which he suggested, Abbott Ionescu scheme. Ionescu was our student in 1967 at IHE Delft. And Abbott was professor of computational hydraulics, so they uh, improved Abbott's scheme, and it's called Abbott-Ionescu scheme to solve, uh, it's a scheme to solve 
uh, particular uh, particular uh, type of equations describing river flow, um, and it's uh, still used with improvements uh, over the time. Now there is also 2D model, which is can be modeled by Mike. 21, so Mike 11 is 1D, Mike 21 is 2D. Mike, because of Mike Abbott, maybe you know, that's why it's called set of tools. Mike 0 is a database platform, Mike 11, Mike 21, and Mike 3, which is 3D model. And Mike, because of Michael Abbott, who created Computational Center in Danish Hydraulic Institute and was first professor of computational hydraulics in Delft. So he studied in Delft in our institute in 62, and two years later became professor there. That's the career development, huh? Not bad. Anyway, and there is also groundwater uh, component. Okay, so own code written. It's not mod flow. It's Mike Shi code. It's different code. And maybe you know that it's not easy to make interface between surface flow and ground flow because equations have different forms. So they're not compatible. So that's uh, also a software problem, how to integrate all this stuff into one integrated system. So uh, the water comes from hydrological load, then it evaporates, there's circulation, then it flows, then it percolates to groundwater, and then there is a, you see here, complex model. So all this is integrated uh, catchment modeling with Mike Shea. It's an example. There are other systems as well. Modflow also is a popular code for groundwater. It's free. The basic code is free. Uh, but interface elements you have to pay, but not much. So uh, Mike Shi is a very expensive system, but Modflow, uh, it's American code, and it um, can be downloaded and widely used in uh, different countries. Now, question to you. Have you heard about lumped conceptual hydrological models? No? Hmm, that's good. Then we learn something new. This is... Class of simple models, very widely used in hydrology, in many countries by different people. Why? Because model is good enough to replicate integrated behavior of a catchment. It's simple, it's understandable, and it's still used. For many uh, practical tasks, it's enough to use this simple hydrological model. It's not distributed, that's why it's called lumped. Conceptual means it follows physics, but only concepts of this physics, not writing down accurate differential equations, all this. That's why it's called conceptual. But in fact, it's physically based. So the model presents a catchment as a set of tanks. So if we look at the catchment, <clears throat> so it's a cross-section like this. So it's a big catchment area. But if we cross-sect, you, you would see this. So rainfall is the input. And what is this arrow going up? Yes? but also transpiration. So it's evaporation from the catchment, but also transpiration of, of this plant. So evapotranspiration, it's called. So sometimes rainfall minus evapotranspiration is called effective rainfall. It means how much water comes into the catchment. That's water comes in. Sometimes also there is a, some flow in. You can also indicate this, but not in this model at this moment. We assume all the water is not coming from rivers here somewhere. No, it comes from rainfall but we lose some water as evapotranspiration happens. Water evaporates again to atmosphere and then comes back during next rainfall. Now, <clears throat> typically you would have overland flow, but if soil is dry, it would take some of the water. You would have a recharge and interflow here. So water would percolate through the soil, unless it's a rock, of course, then it immediately would overland to the river. And we assume there is a river here flowing. So this is outlet of the catchment. So all the water is collected, collected, and then comes to one point where it leaves the catchment. And it leaves typically flowing into the river somewhere, in the point where we stop modeling. Because in the river, we start hydrodynamic modeling, not hydrological modeling. So this is this first part of hydro. Uh, so if we look at the previous picture, so this is this catchment, you see. So it collects all the water from here. And when it reaches maybe this point, we stop modeling because this is hydrodynamic already. It's different equations should be used. So we, in fact, modeling this part of a catchment. And there are mountains here. They're not shown. There should be. It's called watershed. It means that all the water that comes in stays in the catchment. It's watershed because there are mountains 
and water cannot jump over the mountains. Now, <clears throat> so the total amount of water coming in here is summation of overland flow and some sort of intermediate flows, and they have different names. Here it's called interflow and base flow, but they have different names in different books and different uh, systems. So we would talk about overland flow and some, say, maybe base flow. And all of, the, all of it comes over here, uh, summing up. This whole catchment, of course, it's a distributed system, different things happening. But you can say, we don't care what's happening inside the catchment. What we care about is only this point here, and what is the flow towards you in the river, and we want to know what is the flow as a result of rainfall. And we build a tank model. This model is already, I don't know, maybe 70 years old in different types. Sugawara, Japanese scientists, contributed a lot. And there are many other people who would be building their own types of models. But main principle is this. So rainfall and evapotranspiration. Over here, that's the first tank. And you have surface discharge. It's this overland flow, you see? So it leaves this tank. And then part of the water goes down the soil layers. And this is called intermediate discharge. Perhaps it's part of this interflow. Then there is some sort of base discharge. It's somewhere here. And base discharge is this one. So here you have three components, and here you have four components, also possible. Because in nature, there are infinite number of components that form different layers of flow. All of it flows. And it depends on the ability of modeler to split the soil column into several parts. And you can split it in one part, in two, in three, or more. In this case, it's split in, except surface discharge in three blocks. We'll use simpler model, tank model of Sugawara. Yes, by the way, there is also a NAM model of DHI, which is part of MIC-11. So MIC-11 will say hydrodynamic model, but no, it's not right. There is NAM components which form hydrological model. And HBV, have you heard HBV? It's a Swedish model, widely used in Europe, developed more for European catchments with this this type of climate, but it has enough uh, flexibility to be used anywhere practically. So it has snow melt component and so on. So it's a bit better than NAM, but they're very similar. It's also freely downloadable. <coughs> also, if you Google uh, HBV Lite, you get to website of uh, Jan Seibert, who contributed to its development, but he has a web page where you can also get some training in this model for free. You get for free data. You have some codes which you run in, uh, uh, in Excel or in R and so on. So there are many implementations of HB HBV. We have our own implementation of HBV in, in Pascal and Python and MATLAB and all this. So there are plenty of implementations. And uh, widely used model. Right, OK, we discussed all this. So we will look now at this model. You see it has only two tanks. Rainfall comes in, evapotranspiration comes out. And this part forms over, overland flow. But let's see what happens. So if water level is here, if water level is here, there is no overland flow. All of it goes down. Why it is happening? When there is not much water, nothing flows on the surface. Everything goes to the soil, quite naturally. When amount of rainfall increases, water level in this tank would go up, and water starts to flow over land. Okay? This component would start to play. And you see <clears throat> the flow here, Q2, is proportional to this water column height. So H1 mi minus D D2. So D2 is this, and H1 is this. So it's proportional to how much water you have in the tank. More water, more flow. When it reaches this level, more overlet flow would happen. It's sort of flood, perhaps. So a lot of water comes in out here. And some of it, of course, always reaches soil, but a lot leaves uh, through the first tank. So this forms increased overland flow. So in fact, this is a piecewise linear model. Look. This is zero. First, you have zero. Oh, we have a picture. So Q2. So how Q2 depends on, so Q2, oh, what is this? 
this q2 okay and this is h uh, h1 so if h1 is low q2 is zero right when h1 doesn't reach the first outlet there is no overland flow when it reaches its outlet it becomes linearly increasing right because it's proportional to h1 you see it in the formula when it reaches second outlet it it increases faster because you add to this increase also another linear increase which is given by this formula you see this one so this forms the non-linearity in fact you see piecewise linear but overall it's non-linear so people talk about linear reservoirs but if you formulate like this it's non-linear reservoir so and it reasonably well reflects what's happening in the nature as amount of uh, level in this tank increases q2 increases right i open this pen and how do i close it magic disappeared right now what's happening now in the soil so this tank represents the base flow or in intermediate flow uh, uh, so amount of water coming in here also is proportional to h1 as you see so more water here more water comes in here as well linearly and then it fills up the tank it immediately starts discharging into q4 component and it gets higher this component also increases and then it sums up so total runoff is q1 this q2 this and q4 this it's a total runoff that's what we're interested in we're interested in total runoff what are the states in this model states you remember the model input output and states internal states what are the states the sorry there the yes exactly so these are two states water levels here how much water is it shows soil moisture so if there is no water it's a dry soil no water there if it increases soil moisture increase so that's soil moisture and this one as well okay both of them represent soil moisture but at different layers so to say now do we know the flow at different parts of the catchment or soil moisture at different parts of the catchment no we don't this tank represents the whole catchment both tanks from top it's a view from top the whole catchment is one big tank or two tanks on top of each other so it's an integrated aggregated model of the whole catchment so because we're interested only in total runoff we're not interested in soil moisture niche point forget about digital terrain models whatever no need it's not distributed model it is lumped model okay any questions about this model no okay what is the initial state here you remember x0 in the one of the previous slides initial state initial state you have to give so this you see initial value h10 h20 you have to give initial states somehow you have to get it somewhere and we'll talk about this in a second now what are the theta you remember that model there were theta parameters what are the parameters of this model which are fixed in time they don't change in time yeah this case yes indeed we call them conveyance coefficients you can say resistance but it's conveyance because it's proportional it establishes proportionality between amount of water and k so so it's conveyance so higher k high flow so it's conveyance the resistance would be vice versa this coefficients we cannot measure why because it's a catchment of big thing and there are different types of soil in the catchment so what do we measure and what point we don't know so these are unmeasurable coefficients experienced modelers would know more or less the values but we don't know it so we'll determine them by calibration in a second before we do it we'll discuss what calibration is it's not that easy so we say it, they have to be calibrated we'll discuss this so again inputs rainfall 
minus evapotranspiration. This is called effective rainfall in total. So sometimes people say this is output and not input, but in modeling, often it's considered as input with minus. So in fact, this is input. And output is Q, because water, that's what we're interested in. These are states, amount of water in the reservoir. These are states. And you have four unknown parameters showing conveyances of this catchment and two unknown initial values of states. In total, we, we have eight unknown parameters. See? Yes, what are other unknown parameters? It's elevation of these outlets. This elevation is zero, it's fixed. But elevation here, we don't know how fast parameters of this linear function are these elevations, in fact. We don't know them. We have to determine them also by calibration. So this D2 and D1, these values are also unknown. We cannot measure them, of course. So it means we have eight unknown parameters which are fixed in time. All other values have to be calculated every time step, isn't it? So you have to think of a time step. It could be one day or one hour or maybe one week. But often it's one day, daily models or hourly models. So when you know rainfall, there must be, here you see HT, T index, T. It means it's time step T. So rainfall R should also have T here. It's a mistake. And E also should have T. And this Q also should have T. Because every time step, these values are different. These are general equations. But in fact, if we have H1 T, all of these variables should have index T showing that they have the uh, changing value as we go. So this iterative model. So we start with initial values of uh, H1, which is S1, so initial values. And in first rainfall comes in, this initial value. We calculate Q, OK? And then we calculate total Q. And this is the answer for the first time step. Next time step comes. We, rainfall comes in. We put it through. This level increases. Flow changes. This level increases. Flow changes. We recalculate, it would be Q for the next time step. Then new time start comes, no rainfall. We feed in zero. Water flows out, level drops. Water flows in, maybe drops, maybe it doesn't. We don't know. It needs uh, to look at calculation. New Q, it's for the third time step. And as we go, we may go for 10 years like this, if we have data for 10 years, measured rainfall, we can calculate flow for every day of these 10 years. And what we form is time series. Output of these values is a time series or hydrograph. This is hydrograph, and this is hyatograph, R. OK? Now, what we'll do now, we will run this model. So your assignment. Open Python notebook and write this code in Python. <laughs> Nervous laughter. But our students are given this assignment. You as well, no? You followed Juan Carlos' course in Python? No. OK, anyway. So uh, we will not uh, do it. But uh, advice for you to learn Python or any other computer language. Python is advisable because everybody now writes in Python. Five years ago, it was different. Very strange language. I know why, because it was written by a Dutch student in the beginning of 90s. He was in Amsterdam. I'm not sure what substances he was using when he was writing this language, but it's absolutely crazy language. But when he moved to Google and uh, worked for Google, now he works for Dropbox, actually. So uh, Python changed in time, and now millions of people use it uh, because it's free. The uh, problem with Python was that there were no toolboxes. But last five, seven years, a lot of toolboxes were generated by enthusiasts. Quality of them is not always excellent, but good enough for many, a lot of research. And quality goes up and up. So if you think of MATLAB, MATLAB would have better toolboxes, but each of them costs $400. So it's not cheap. So for researchers, option is to indeed use uh, Python. But since we're not prepared for this, today we will not do it. We will now go to the downloads, which I gave you. Uh, 
Can you see this? No, you cannot read it, but fine. So I gave you a download which was called software, right? You have it? Laptops? <coughs> yes, you get your laptop. And we're interested now. So it's an exercise, first exercise. Maybe we'll continue after break, but let's start, set up the scene. We have to stop at 12.15? Yeah. And then when do we get back at 2? Okay, so please open uh, your folder called 10. <coughs> okay. okay, so maybe we run a bit of 12, 20, 12, 30 maybe. So, we need this folder. Can you read this? No? No, not really. Tank X folder. You should have had a file which is called Tank X RAR. Tank X extended. Tank model extended. Unzip or unrar this folder in. Yes. Unrar this folder into any folder you like. Yes, you have it? Good. And then uh, double click Tank X. You should see this. <coughs> You see, it's, the model is already 13 years old. And basics of it were written much earlier than this. But it's a simple model, so we use it a lot because it's for understanding principles, very nice, simple. Now, what do we see here? Let's look at the screen. <coughs> so, let's first look at the folder. So, if you look at the folder, what do you see? Executable? You also see the file called SXCLL calibration. You see in the folder. S6, so let's look into it. Open it with a new, uh, new tab, sorry, uh, no tab, notepad. Can you open it? Just look into it. I just want to show you what files are so that later you can change them, uh, them yourself. You have to right click on it and choose Notepad or Notepad++, whatever you use for text editing. It's a text file. Here you can read it now. Yeah. So you have here effective rainfall input. Now first, let's start from the beginning. Catchment area in square kilometers. So you needed to calculate total amount of water because you have millimeters to multiply by the area to have total amount. Okay, so that's what it is. Now frequency of observations. Zero, if you put zero, it should be hours days, weeks, months, and so on. This simple example of 53 weeks, weekly date. Very rough model, not terribly useful, but okay, let's use it, okay? Code of runoff measurement. Cubic meters a second, or unknown. So unknown. Strangely, I'm not sure. Durgal al Shrestha wrote this code. Actually, it's a question to me why it just says unknown. It should be QMAC, but anyway. Error codes. It depends how you calculate error. We use weighted root mean squared error uh, and code 3. If you use other codes, you can also calculate error using different types of things. And the rest is data for 53 days. There is much more than that, but we read only 53 lines from this file. Only first 53 lines. Now, another file which is important is var file. var file shows number of variables in this model and ranges for this model. Uh, there is no need to use it, but we use it for calibration purpose later. 
So that's why this file is here. So what these ranges show? We don't know the values of these variables, eight variables. We discussed eight variables, you remember, to determine. And for these variables, hydrologists say, okay, first variable should be between 200 and 500. Second variable between zero and 200, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this gives you possible ranges, physically somehow justifiable ranges, for the variables we have to calibrate later. The rest, yes. And the pin file, G pin file, if you look into it, you will see eight numbers. These eight numbers is the vector of parameters that the model will use when it's run. So these are exact values, not, but they should be inside these ranges. I will show you later how we calibrate this, but if you do manual calibration, you can change these values yourself, and every time you can save this, and it will be new file, when you run it later, you will use it. You, you give it a name, G1, G2, or whatever names you, you choose, you can have several models by this. Yes, there was a question? These are eight parameters of the model. So these are, these eight parameters, you see? These eight. S1, S2, D1, D2, and these four parameters. These are uh, Order I will show you on the screen. Not, not like here, but like on the screen, yes. Order is this, D1, D2, K1, K2. Oh no, no, it's a good question, what, what is the order? Uh, but we could uh, say, oh, it's a good question. So the first two are D1, D2. Uh, then uh, four Ks and the last one S1, S2, I think. Let me see. <coughs> no, but I don't have three hands. <laughs> so if I do it like this, do I have this maybe in the holder? No? Okay, anyway. Let's see. If I speak like this, it's okay? But nobody complains from other side of Brazil. So are these people there still? They're doing well, I feel it. Maybe they have fun already, carnival or something. So you see these four parameters are these K parameters in the middle, okay? Uh, and soil moisture, let me answer this question. Uh, no, these are elevations. So first two are D1, D2, please take a note. And these last two are initial soil moisture values, and these are conveyances. Let's go back to the model. <coughs> so in this model, <coughs> what will be used are parameters which are on the screen. It will run using parameters, conveyances which are here presented, and uh, the values all will be used. Now, calibration data, the rainfall data actually, it will take rainfall data from this file, S6. And when I click, yes, an output file will be put into uh, the ask file. This model is smart enough to know in which folder is it running, you see? So it, because it detects from Windows in which folder it was started. It was started in this folder called Dimitri work on laptop Brazil 929 materials tank X, okay? It's what you see here. And in your case, you see different folder. Is it correct folder? Yeah, is it the folder you use? Okay, good. So let's run the model now. Click run the model. So what we see here is the runoff of the, for the 53 time steps. So the model was running 53 times, every time calculating discharge for every time step, okay? The measured data is given by black line. This is measured data. Measured data, how do we know? Model doesn't know about measured data anything. It was in this cal calibration file. One of the columns is this measured data. Black line, you see this? And red line is the value generated for each time step here, for each time step by the model. So this line is simply connected 53 lines. There is no line. There are 53 values only. 
please understand that. There is no smooth line. No, it doesn't exist. It just looks smooth, but in fact there are values connected, you see. 53 values. Do you have the same? Good. So these are default values which are hard-coded into the model. That's why you all get the same result. But you can change them and save them, and then you will have your own model. Now, we have a competition now. Unfortunately, when yesterday, I typically buy a present for those who compete. But unfortunately, in Schiphol, we were running to the plane, and there was no shop on the way to buy a present for you. So perhaps you will get a cookie tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, so those of you who will uh, end up with the best possible model by calibrating it, and we will do calibration manually today. Ta -da! Not yet, too early. <laughs> so who will be the best? So now look, how do we know the model is good? First of all, is a good model visual inspection or bad? Not very good model, you see? Here, suddenly flow goes up when observed was here, peaks, What's happening here? It's very far from observed. And this is the root mean squared error. It says weighted, but in fact weight is one, so it's just purely root mean squared error. Do you know what is root mean squared error? Homework for you to find it out. But I will give you also in the lectures the formula. Anyway, it's an error of the model, some average error across the whole run. It's 12. So for me, it's a bit high. We will now try to reduce the error. So first, where is the first problem of this model? Can you tell me immediately? How do we immediately could improve the model, the error, a bit? Look at the hydrograph. So these are two hydrographs. One measured, real, and here, look. Model output here on the first step is much higher than what was observed. What is the reason for it? So look at this, ah, sorry, microphone, yes, thank you. So what is the reason that the reason? Exactly, initial state of the model, if we look at uh, the first value that model gives is 20, but what was observed is five, okay? So model says there is much more water leaving the system than in fact in reality was observed. Where this water is coming from? From rainfall? Hardly, because we have only one step made. So not much water came in during this step from rainfall. It was already in the system. And it was flowing out at very high rate. So much more water, five times more water left the system than was observed. So what is the reason? Where this water was in the system? Initial state, indeed. So initial state is amount of water in the tanks. Assumption was too high about the uh, initial state. So initial state on this screen is 40 and 59. It's too high. It gives you much higher out, outflow then was observed. So let's try to reduce this initial amount of water, initial state, in the tank to some lower value and see if it helps. So let's do it. So let's change 40 to 4, for example, just 10 times, and 59 to 5, okay? And run the model again. Oh, look. I run the model again, I change these two values, you see, to much lower, 10 times lower. But now model gives you output which is much lower than observed. So I went too far. So let's return S1 to 10, say, something like this. And this one, say, I don't know, also to 10. Let's run the model. Okay, it's a bit better, let's say this would be 50. No, it doesn't help, and this would be 20. Oh, look, almost perfect fit on the first step. See this? So initial state, I think I found it more or less right, 15, 20. It could be 20, 15, it doesn't matter much because all this water outflows. 
So this water flows here, this water flows here, so it doesn't matter what you assume. We don't know exactly, it, it doesn't matter much. So we're okay. So why do you think water flow? Yes, by the way, let me show you the rainfall. Let's look at this place. Here, rainfall comes in. So before we Skype, we lost them. questions in the live. Okay, good. So we have to come to an end. So I want to make one more thing uh, with this model. If we go to virtual tank view, virtual tank view, click this button, please. You see it shows initial state in the tanks. These are two tanks. And this would show the outflow, okay? And please click on hydrograph as well here. And click on animate. It's very slow because delay is high. We can reduce delay a bit. Do you have this? Yes, running? So from top you see this plot, it's rainfall. And you see increase in flow here happens because there was a rainfall. And increase here in flow happens because there was a lot of rainfall. So we can see from hydrograph that model reacts too much to the increased rainfall. It releases much more water than it was observed. So if we exit from this, you would see that here rainfall comes in here. By the way, I, I, sorry, I forgot to show you rainfall here. Click rainfall, show rainfall. So you see rainfall comes in, uh, flow increases, but much faster than it was observed. What is the reason for it? Why we lose water much faster from the catchment than it was observed? What's happening? Exactly. So conveyance, we set up to high values. So conveyance is high. So water easily leaves the reservoir, one and two. We don't know exactly which one because we don't have states. So we have total. So let's try to reduce conveyance of this. So increase resistance of the soil towards the water. Then water would lead, leave the system in a sl s slower pace. So how do we do it? We change coefficients, uh, so K1 doesn't, is not so important because it's very high, so let's not touch it. Easier to work with uh, K4 and K2, perhaps K3, we'll see, but K2 and K4. So if we change K2 and K4 to higher values, so let's change K2 to 0, 0.9 and K4 to 0, 0.6, okay? And let's run. Somehow it didn't change much, so let's uh, change it to maybe here, two, doesn't help. Let's change K3 to oh sorry, I increased conveyance. It was intelligence test. Sorry, I made a mistake, but now I want to convert it to as if I deliberately did it and nobody told me. So I should reduce conveyance, of course, to lower values from what we had. So we can say here, what was the initial conveyance of K2, K4? Anybody remembers? Let's put it both to, uh, to uh, zero, 0,1. Look, amount of water leaving the system considerably dropped, you see? So I changed it too much, perhaps. Let's make them 0 0.15, 0 0.15. See what happens. Look, it's much better now, isn't it? If it's 0 0.15, both K2 and K4, 
here we have good fit to reality, right? Error dropped from 12 to 6.9. Here we still have maybe not terribly good, but here we almost reproduced peak. So the model already improved. So it's called manual or trial and error calibration. What we're doing is calibration of the model. What is calibration? Calibration is changing unknown parameters, k1, k2, and so on, in such a way that error goes down. It is an optimization problem. We choose independent variables to take values that would reduce objective function here, which is the error. It goes down, 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 and visual inspection in fact, simply reflects what is calculated here in the error. Your job would be to finish calibration. We'll do it after the break. So this value can be made lower. Not much lower, but can be made lower. And those who get the, uh, the best value would be the winner, at least virtual winner of this uh, competition. So think what else you could change. Also, I should say these parameters are interdependent. Uh, maybe you can increase this, decrease this, or vice versa. So it's not very clear how to do calibration sometimes. But maybe we don't need absolutely accurate models. So if you get a bit lower error, it's already good. Questions? No questions? So what we covered now? We introduced the main notion of the modeling, OK, main notions. We introduced the input-output model with the states. And here we demonstrated how this model works in a simple case when we're building a lumped conceptual model, hydrological model of a simple catchment, where we're interested only in the total runoff. We're not interested in distributed modeling. We're interested in lumped modeling. And this model reflects quite well what's happening in the catchment. Here, not terribly well, but here, look, it's already, it's already OK. I have a question now. Shall we have lunch? Yes. Answer is yes, thank you. So that's the answer to the question we pose. And there is no uncertainty there. It's absolutely deterministic. Yeah. Good. So then we see each other very soon at 2 o'clock. Don't be late. Also, look, uh, since after lunch, uh, difficult time after lunch, you get food, blood goes to the stomach away from your head, you may go to sleep. So don't eat too much, OK? Let's agree. Don't eat these huge pieces of meat like you typically get. You know, people come to you and cut off these big pieces of meat. Brazilian lunch, you know. OK, and uh, for people that are watching us by distance, uh, you can send your question in the chat on, on, in the chat on YouTube. And uh, so they are already saying thank you for, for you, but uh, I guess until now there is no question. I will answer. It was a pleasure okay. to have you with us even when we did not see you. <laughs> yeah, it's people from Simepar and also people from uh, the Northeast, UFCG. And, okay. Good. Hey. Good. So see you at two o'clock. <laughs>